At first glance, Argentina seems to have it all. Fertile farming lands, bountiful freshwater sites, access to the world's oceans, growing demographics, and so on. Yet, something's rotten in the state of Argentina. In 1910, the country ranked as one of the world's wealthiest. Annual growth averaged 5%, and its per capita GDP rivaled that of Belgium. Yet, by 2000, the wheels had come off. The per capita GDP dropped, and since then, Buenos Aires has teetered on the edge of bankruptcy, surviving paycheck to paycheck. Many explanations were submitted. One that gained prominence, especially following his death, was that fault lay with the former president Juan Domingo Perón. It was Perón whose corporatist governance stifled innovation. Perón who placed populist agitation over Argentina's economic well-being. Perón, whose charismatic authority hampered stable governance. All the blame for Argentina's troubles were heaped onto his uncomplaining shoulders. Yet, structural issues are rarely due to personality defects, and economic woes long predated Perón's government. So, why did Argentina stop growing? Why did it never develop into a prosperous nation like Japan, France or Canada? and what caused its slow, aching and long decline. This video is sponsored by Masterworks. The future of Argentina is not looking so good. Inflation is expected to hit 95% and for citizens, there are only so many ways to preserve wealth. With the S&P 500 down this year, index funds seem to be a losing gambit. However, according to a McKinsey study, the biggest banks and institutions are investing anywhere between 30 and 50% of their assets into alternatives. Asset managers are now following suit, and alternatives are seen as a way to shield clients from high volatility and skyrocketing interest rates. Like anything in investing, timing is everything. But one platform is ahead of the curve, Masterworks. They let you invest in an alternative specifically named by Goldman Sachs and BlackRock as being crucial for the next decade, contemporary art. As an asset, art has outpaced the S&P 500 for the last 26 years with 13.8% appreciation for contemporary art versus 10.3% return for the S&P. Masterworks has so far sold 6 paintings for an average return of 29% to their members, including a sale just last month for a 33.1% return. Which is incredible because at the same time the S&P 500 was down around 20%. Masterworks has done so well they've had to release more art on their platform to meet demand. And there's a waitlist, but you can skip it by just clicking the link in the description. When measuring a state's living standards there are lies, damned lies and GDP per capita statistics. Productivity measures can be useful, but alone, they reveal nothing of a society's actual conditions. Argentina is a case in point. Though by 1900 it ranked highly on standard metrics, land policy remained rooted in the 16th century. And though land is the source of all wealth, in Argentina, land distribution led to development mediocrity. Like all settler societies, Argentina's land policy was determined by colonization patterns. Violence and the prerogative of force guided land transfers from the indigenous peoples to the conquerors. The original titles were written not in ink but in blood. Soldiers and the politically well-connected carved out vast estates called estancias. And this top-heavy system of proprietorship ensured wealth, status and political power. By the late 17th century, this tendency had spread to the River Plate. The collapse of Spain in 1808 opened a political vacuum, allowing the land-owning estancieros to monopolize power. By the 1860s, rural elites took control of Buenos Aires, ruling through a sham democracy. 
Free from Madrid's authority, the new state expanded south into the Pampas. New lands were granted to settlers, but the lion's share went to the already wealthy. Advances in refrigeration technology and the absence of a domestic market meant the estancieros relied on exports to realize profits. Most were destined for the industrial hub of Britain. As such, British investments began to seep into Argentina, monopolizing the country's railways to ensure export stability. Britain thereby stepped into the imperial role that Spain had once occupied. Here, the Estencieros' self-interest clashed with development priorities. Having acquired their land by less sophisticated means, their wealth and influence dependent on Argentina remaining a source of raw agricultural commodities. There was thus no impetus to move up the value chain or industrialize. Instead, these functions were left to Britain confining Argentina to stagnation. Moreover, as immigrants poured into the river plate, many became tenant farmers on the estancias. Here, excessive rents gobbled up the surplus of farmers and this undermined the consumer demand that would have made domestic manufacturing economically viable. While this led to an agricultural boom, long term, it halted Argentine development. The ruling estancieros were untroubled by this though. Most were happy to watch their export revenues and ground rents roll in. Thus, by 1900, Argentina entered a relative GDP per capita peak. Yet, this apparent prosperity was profoundly unequal and dependent on export markets. Selectively shot footage of downtown Buenos Aires concealed the darker reality of urban squalors and self-help housing. Meanwhile, fresh waves of Spanish and Italian migration placed stress on existing infrastructures. And since most were employed in the farm export industry, education and literacy standards remained low. Argentina's outward-facing economic structure left it vulnerable to global shocks. So when the Great War broke out in 1914, export markets were clobbered. Electoral reforms provided a window for urban workers to form a government, and in 1916, the Radical Party assumed power on an anti-elite ticket, which they maintained until 1930. Though they were successful in pushing industrialization and job creation, rising living standards bid up food prices and labor costs and this threatened the farm export model on which the estancieros depended. Tensions came to a head with the Wall Street crash of 1929. The resulting Great Depression caused global export markets to collapse. Combined with severe droughts, this threw agricultural workers onto the street, sparking civil unrest. So, in 1930, under the pretext of stabilization, the Estancieros backed a military coup that established another sham democracy. Though Argentina dodged the brunt of the depression, London's decision to enact beef tariffs threatened its economic recovery. Now in control of government, the Estancieros again acted to ensure their interests. And in 1933, Buenos Aires signed the lopsided roca runkiman Treaty. To maintain beef exports, Argentina would become a captive market for British coal and oil. British interests also gained a privileged position in Argentina's meat processing and sales industries. Plus, the British were exempt from labor laws. Once more, this confined Argentina to resource extraction while Britain sat atop the value chain. Naturally, anti-British and anti-oligarch sentiments rose throughout the 1930s, and when the Second World War broke out in 1939, this formed a breeding ground for economic nationalism. Wartime industrial expansion granted the urban labor force new political clout, and in 1943, another military coup reorganized Argentine society yet again. This time, the main benefactor was Army Colonel Juan Domingo Perón. Upon being appointed as Labor Secretary, Perón used his position to cultivate loyalists and foster a populist political base. 
and when democracy was restored in 1946, he rode this wave straight to the presidential palace, seeking to implement another state cooperatist government model, Perón nationalized Argentina's railways in exchange for cancelling Britain's wartime debts. He also effectively enacted export tariffs, pushing down domestic food prices and raising state revenues. This money was put towards social welfare programs and industrial subsidies. These policies were not unusual for the time, However, geopolitical factors soon rendered them unviable. Wartime neutrality meant Argentina was excluded from Washington's Marshall Plan aid. Instead, US dollars were pumped into Europe, cycling them back to the United States as agricultural purchases. Argentina was cut out of this loop, depriving it of the foreign exchange needed to import the technologies and energy resources synced with industrialization. By 1949, the economy was in a crisis. Export earnings dropped a third, dollar reserves vanished, industrial output stalled, unemployment was rampant, and inflation soared to 33%. Peron had no choice but to cut spending, revive the export industry, and open Argentina to foreign capital. Yet this undermined Peron's nationalist credentials. He responded by cracking down on dissidents, only to hit a third rail by challenging the Catholic Church. So in 1955, the former colonel was himself deposed in a coup and exiled to Madrid. Political instability remained elusive though. Argentina's return to democracy in 1958 was reversed by another coup in 1966. Even so, living standards continued to rise despite a drop in the country's per capita GDP. But the real decline began in 1973, when an oil shock and the collapse of the Bretton Woods system led to a downtrend in world conditions. The agricultural export market was decimated, and foreign investment slowed to a trickle. Desperate, the military dictatorship invited Peron back to head a democratic coalition. But neither he nor a cabinet filled of economists could solve the country's problems. After his death in 1974, Peron was succeeded by his wife Isabel, but she too was unequal to stabilizing the economy. A failed austerity program led to rises in fuel, transport and utility costs, bringing on a collapse in real wages, hyperinflation and a recession. Once more, restoring stability formed a rationale for another coup in 1976, but the junta was backed by the oligarchs who sought to restore the dominance of agriculture. This led to deregulation, privatizations, removal of tariffs protections, and extensive loans, which ballooned Argentina's foreign debt to $31 billion, or two-fifths of its GDP. The result was deindustrialization, mass unemployment, and a halving of real industrial wages. Resistance was met with force and up to 30,000 political dissidents disappeared at the hand of the government, never to be heard from again. Meanwhile, the loosening of capital controls let oligarchs move their money offshore. And in 1981, another currency devaluation intended to boost exports led to a run on the peso, resulting in capital flight. Desperate for a political win, the junta fell back on nationalist swindle by invading the Falkland Islands, whose sovereignty it disputed with Britain. But this plan backfired when the UK forces successfully retook the islands. Thereafter, the junta collapsed and democracy was restored in 1983. It was left to the government of Raul Alfonsin to rebuild a shattered country. But this was impossible given the destruction of Argentina's industrial base and the fact that the interest repayments on foreign debts were eating up more than half of the export earnings. Alfonsin had little choice but to request an IMF loan to avoid bankruptcy. And this meant imposing austerity on Argentina. The economy improved somewhat, but water shortages and forced blackouts aroused social discontent. 
and a spurt of hyperinflation due to money printing which in 1989 reached 28,000% allowed the Peronists to return to power. Yet once there, the new president, Carlos Menem, abandoned social democracy in favor of continued austerity and deindustrialization. To arrest inflation, he also introduced the convertible peso, which was pegged to the US dollar. This was funded by the extensive borrowing of US dollars and the sale of state enterprises to private actors. Interestingly, inflation eased and there was stable growth. But even so, by 1997, the building debt had placed convertibility under stress. Menem refused to abandon the peg, since doing so would crush economic confidence. As a result, the country slid into recession, and in 1999, the hot potato fell into the leap of Menem's successor, Fernando de la Rua. A surging dollar pushed up an already overvalued peso, undermining export competitiveness. Buenos Aires abandoned the peg, leading to a bank run as Argentines withdrew their money while it still had value. The government tried to halt the crisis by freezing dollar accounts, but in December 2001, the entire system came crashing down. Argentina defaulted on its $80 billion foreign debt. GDP contracted by one-third, riots erupted, and Buenos Aires switched presidents four times in three weeks. It was the worst depression in the country's history. In sum, Argentina's 20th century was marked by its failures to address the structural issues caused by its agrarian economic base. Those who benefited sought to maintain the status quo. But this came at the cost of industrial development. The resulting tensions undermined political stability, frustrating rational policymaking and long-term planning. Consequently, ordinary Argentines lost faith in the political class. And it was in this soil that the myth of the long decline took root. Simplistic though it is, its psychological appeal is all too human. Because ultimately it is easier for one to mourn their lost potential than to accept they never had it in the first place. I've been your host Chirvan from Caspian Report. If you approve of the work we do, please consider joining our Patreon community page or the YouTube membership program. Joining either helps us to keep our content objective and our channel self-sustaining. Thank you for watching and Sahol.